So what's the weirdest experience you've had on a sales call? The weirdest experience. So <laughs> I was, I was closing this lady. Like we just had a 30, 40 minute conversation. And then as I'm closing her, as I'm asking for money, she walks into the bathroom. She doesn't even set down her phone. She set, like, she sets up her phone like this on the stall and then just starts taking a shit. Like, oh my God. <laughs> it was crazy. What did you say? I, I asked for money. <laughs> I just pretend like it, I had no idea what to do. I just pretended like it didn't happen. Oh my God. Yeah. She didn't end up closing, but it was. That, that's wild. You had someone take a shit in front of you on a sales call. Yeah. Did, uh, did Alex teach you how to handle that objection? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. We, we train that every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. All right, guys, this is uh, Jacob Hopkins. Welcome to the show or whatever. This is Jacob. Um, this is Jacob's second ever podcast. So give him a warm welcome in the chat. Um, oh, I forgot to like post this on my Instagram and stuff. Um, maybe, that'll... maybe that'll be cool. Maybe you, I don't know yeah. if you're able to do it even, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll do it with my, with my little following. Um... But yeah, we're here. And um, I went to Post Malone last night uh, and... <laughs> I haven't like gone out out in a while and I, we kind of went out. So a little bit of a slow start. We were supposed to start this at 10 a.m. It's 1045 a.m. At least where I am. But I'm excited. We have a lot of really good stuff to talk about today. Um, for those of you guys that don't know, Jacob, Jacob, how old are you? 20? You're 20 now, right? I just turned 21. You just turned 21. Okay. Yeah. So, so Jacob... Jacob um, is the 21-year-old neighbor of Alex Hermosi, who, if you don't know who Alex Hermosi is, I don't know, you probably, this podcast, I mean, it'll probably still be interesting to you, but I don't know. You should probably know who it is. He's kind of, uh, he's a big deal. Just he's, look he's, him up real quick. Yeah. yeah, just look him up. Yeah, and and um, you know what's crazy about Alex is I found him when he had like a thousand followers. And really? I was messaging. Yeah, and I was messaging him. That was probably around the time that you started working with him. Um, How long ago was that? Yeah, it was probably like two years ago. Sick. Is that when yeah. you met him? I met him probably like five years ago. Oh, okay. Five. Yeah. Got it. So walk us through that. Why don't we just start there? Because I'm sure, I mean, you'll obviously develop your own identity, but for now, you're Alex's, you're Alex's neighbor. So, <laughs> so, hey, so I'll roll with it. <laughs> so walk us through like what was it like meeting him for the first time like how did how did that all go down yeah so i guess i don't even remember the first time alex was just like the best neighbor so he'd bring my parents cookies like the whole thing he'd always be walking around the neighborhood you know that sort of thing i think the first time we actually had interactions i, I had my first business was a mobile car detailing business so I'd go around, I'd knock doors to everyone in my neighborhood to try to detail their cars. And I ended up, I, I started detailing Alex's cars. So I'd do it like once a month, a couple times a month for, I think I did it for like two years. So that was the first kind of experience I had meeting Alex and actually talking to him, which was just him coming out and paying us for washing his cars. Mm. Did he have nice cars? Yeah. A Bentley and an i8. Really? Yeah. Uh, that, that's actually extremely surprising because he doesn't show anything like that on socials. So he likes yeah. cars. He's a car guy. He sold them. So he, uh, yeah, he sold them. So I don't think he's that, that into them. He was convinced my understanding of the story. One of his friends convinced him to buy one. So he just bought one and then he sold it like two years later. Mm. Wow. That's interesting. Okay, so you were detailing his cars, and then um, one day he was like, hey, kid, like, you want to work for a gym launch or what? Like, what happened? <laughs> so this was – so 29 – so I started the car detailing business, and I, was, I would do that on the side throughout high school. And it got to the point where I saved up some money, so I wanted to get into e-commerce because I was always on YouTube trying to figure out 
you know, what, what's the thing? How do I make money? How do I not go to college? How do I have freedom, travel, all that stuff, right? And where so, was that belief, where was that belief instilled? I have no idea. Like, YouTube? I, I, YouTube, most yeah. likely. People on YouTube. And so, yeah, that's, that's what my game plan was. I knew the car washing business probably wouldn't get me there. And so I started e-commerce. So I started scaling that store December or it was, it was like almost September of 2019. I started scaling that store and I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. And then I invested, do you know, Scott Hilsey or Hills? Sounds very familiar. I think so. I yeah. I, I invested in his program for drop mm -hmm. shipping. So mm -hmm. I started drop shipping and I, I got to the point where I think the, first month I did 4,000. Then I scaled up to like 28,000 and 35,000 from his program. And so that kind of broke revenue. my belief. Revenue. 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 Yeah. Dro so, Dropshippers love talking about their revenue. Yeah, they do. What was the profit? When I was doing 35,000, I made like 6,000. Okay. That's still pretty good. I mean, that's, yeah. that's it's not more terrible, but it's not, it's not crazy. Yeah. And so I was scaling that. And then I started getting all these emails mm -hmm. saying I couldn't ship it because of COVID. Oh. And I didn't know what COVID was at the time. It was like <laughs> coronavirus. <laughs> it was before everything just went crazy. Also, I don't think we can say it. I think we should say uh, We okay. can't say, we can't say. And also I messed up the streaming. So I'll post this to Rumble later, but the streaming is not, it's not streaming on Rumble right now. So just use the C word, Mr. T for Mr. T, yeah, Alex yeah, yeah. isn't really an enemy of, you know, the evil, whatever. And we'll talk about that later. So we can just, yeah. we can say Alex. Yeah. Um, okay. The C word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The C word. So I didn't know what that was at the time because this was December and it wasn't a huge thing. And I was just in high school, senior year of high school, scaling the store, responding to emails, you know, and all of a sudden my store just crashed because I couldn't ship anymore because the supply mm -hmm. chain. If, if you guys don't know what drop shipping is, I honestly don't like the business model at all, but you take stuff from China and you ship it to the U S it takes forever to ship. The supply chain got destroyed. Right. And so that business crashed and I was, when that business crashed, I was honestly pretty sad. Mm -hmm. That was my ticket out. And so I was yeah. in between, I was in between choosing three schools. So it was university of San Diego, Pepperdine and San Diego state. And so I was in between choosing those three schools and I ended up choosing Pepperdine last minute, the latest decision you could make because I thought it'd be the only school to open. Cause this is when the C word went crazy. Right. And so to fast forward two weeks before schools actually start so about to start, it just, the only school that didn't open was Pepperdine. So the other two, schools, <laughs> and that was the reason I chose it, like the leading factor. Yeah. And so the other, the other two schools opened and two weeks before they just shot me a message saying, Hey, you have to stay home. And I was bummed. I was ready to go to the beach. Have you, have you seen Pepperdine? Have you been out there? No, but I can imagine. Yeah, it's nice. And so it, I, then I just came up with this app idea. So I was like, okay, this is what's going to take me out of college. I'm going to drop out of school. I'm going to create this sick app. It was, are you familiar with Bump back in the day? No. So it's, it was just an exchange contact app where you could just like bump your phone. So I wanted to bring that back in a different way. It, it, was, yeah. it was kind of a cool idea, but kind of dumb at the same time. But it, but it opened up an opportunity because I call everyone I knew. And I called them and said, you know, hey, I got this app. I, I'm looking for investors. And then as I was driving to say goodbye to my last friend, I got this text and it was from Alex and he's like, I have five minutes. So I whip my car around, I drive back to his house mm -hmm. and I go in there. I'm sweating. I'm so nervous. <laughs> Cause you can't imagine. Why, were, why are you nervous? It was, he's a big dude. Have you seen him? He's intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You like so, knew what, you knew. So you knew what he did and stuff or like, how much did you know about him? At this time, not that much because this was before You're... he was big. I knew he ran gym launch. I didn't really know what gym launch was or to what extent. Yeah. You're just like yeah. big. He didn't have a brand yet. So you're just like big warrior looking dude who looks like he's about to like go into battle. 
with a mustache. He had the mustache at the time too. I clean his car. He's pretty quiet. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's so, so funny because he's like, I mean, if you know his brand, he's like the most nice, least intimidating dude in the. I mean, he's intimidating, mm-hmm. but like he's so like humble and nice that like it's hard to imagine being like. I mean, if you if you were like you know if he was angry at you i think it'd be very scary but how tall is he by the way he's a 5'11 okay he's a big dude yeah yeah he's like he's like right at six foot so he's yeah. a big dude and so okay, yeah I, I, wa- I walked in there and i walked in to pitch him at my pitch deck and it was a blur i just pitched him i had no idea what i was doing and he just looks up at me and he goes why do you think you could do that <laughs> 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 so, is, well, hold on. i'm a little i'm a little hung over a little slow right now what did you yeah. pitch him on this app so oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I find that particularly funny because like i had a um i had an app too when i was no way uh, yeah when i was 19 18 19 and um, I had sort of a similar, like, uh, R-word moment. <laughs> Just, like, um, I watched the social network. And I saw Zuckerberg. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to make an app. And um, I was like, there was, like, a three-week period. I was trying to convince my roommates in college to um, learn how to code. <laughs> and, like, I was a fucking film major. Like, I'm so technologically not like a coder. Mm-hmm. And um, I my roommates were just not into it either. I was just like every day, like, oh, come on, guys. Like, we got to learn Python. Like, we're going to build an app. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and then I took the the uh, app and I was like, all right, I'm not going to be de- the developer. I'm going to find a developer. And then I started figuring out there's like a lot of people in college that are like, entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and really they just have like super rich parents and like you know they think they're smart and i went to this one kid in the dining hall because my roommate was like oh you got to meet this kid like he's like a big like he made a lot of money in high school and like he's like and i went and told him the idea and he like looked at me straight up and was like just like like directly into my soul was like yep this idea is worth about $250,000. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> and I thought I was like rich. What? Mine was worth zero. So Yeah, well, well, like I, I know, but like it's so funny because like, like in my situation, in your situation, you had someone who knew what they were talking about. In my situation, I just had a complete fraud. Just like, <laughs> tell me I'm a genius. And then I spent the next year like building this $250,000 app idea. (laughs) And like, you know, the most I'd made in the day was, I spent a year on it. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, okay. So, so, (laughs) so Alex says, um, why do you think you could do that? And you have to imagine, I'm, I was so nervous going into it and then he just laid the boot and he did it in a nice way. Right. But, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i was working on this oh, thing for like two or three months before so i made this you know i relate so hard bro <laughs> i made this full slide deck i paid this guy from google a ux designer like 400 500 bucks <laughs> to make this whole deck <laughs> what's funny you know what's funny about it is like looking back now i understand exactly why alex reacted that way you know because <laughs> like for him, for you to come up and say that, like, is so, <laughs> it's so insane. But, but the reason you did it is because you saw the social network. Yep. Right. That's your why. Point. And that there's, that's like a thing that I bet a lot of people, a lot of guys our age, like, did. We were just like, I, I, can, I, do can, it. Like, I can just, I can do this. I'm Zuckerberg. And then he just said, why do you think you can do that? <laughs> okay continue yeah so (laughs) he was pretty much you can't code and you can't sell 
So what's your, <laughs> what's your value? And so I had no idea how to answer him. So I just remember walking out, packed up my laptop, got in my car, drove back to my friend's house, idea crushed. <laughs> so this is like the second idea crushed I've had because I had the drop shipping. I thought that would get me out. And then it was this. And then <laughs> a couple days later, I get a text from him and he's like, where do you lift? And I said, the local gym, it's called HCI. And he said, come start lifting with me. And so it got, got to the point. And at this time, again, I didn't have the perspective to know exactly to what degree his success is. Yeah. And so I just, I just started lifting with him and <clears throat> We lifted a couple times a week and I ended up getting into, are you familiar with wholesaling? No. So real estate wholesaling is where you basically find a property, you put it under contract and then you sell the contract. Got it. And so I started doing that. I invested all of my money, all my savings from drop shipping, me and my you know buddy Blake invested everything into it. And then we started losing like three to four grand a month doing it. And this nice. is, yeah, so this is the time I was lifting with Alex. I was losing all this money. I had no idea what to do. And I was in school. So I was still at Pepperdine doing school completely online. And honestly, it was pretty tough because all my friends left. And so I was very isolated at mm -hmm. that time. And I, was, I was trying to figure it out because I didn't, I didn't enjoy school at all. I wanted to do business, but the business was failing and my attention was split. And so Alex comes up to me. One day I actually took a sales call. He has a TikTok about this. I took a sales call in his house. I picked up the phone, a prospect called me and I hung up the phone. He goes, you suck at sales. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and so anyways, from that point, I was losing all this money and he just got to the point where he said, you need to learn sales. So come to gym launch. So I started mm -hmm. cold calling at gym launch. Have you ever done cold calls? No, it's tough. It's tough. I can so, imagine. Yeah. So I started doing cold calls for gym launch and this was end of December, 2020, I believe. And yeah, man, I started doing those. Um, got to the point where as soon as I took that job, my first paycheck came through at like $375. And then that's the point where I said, I'm going to move out of my parents' house. I'm just going to make this work. So I dropped the real estate thing. I went full on with sales. And when I started, I didn't even have like a salary. I wasn't hourly. It was just straight commission. So I got mm -hmm. paid. I forgot. It was like 50 to hundred dollars per, per call, book called I had. So I just started booking these like crazy. Just went all in, started studying sales. I went through that phase. Did you ever go through like the cold shower phase? Where you yeah, do of course. Yeah. 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 So I went, I went through that phase of just like trying to make my <laughs> life as painful as possible for no reason to be <laughs> The thing. <laughs> so, the app phase is quickly followed by the cold shower phase. <laughs> it's the reality check, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I started I started doing that, and it got to the point where, when I started that, I had no idea what closing was. So I started mm -hmm. cold calling. Alex gave me the advice. He goes, "You'll get fired if you don't." outperform the entire team or at least continue to perform with them. And they're mm -hmm. all right. He's like, they're all, yeah. you know, 30 years old. You have to jump in there and you have to do well off the bat. So the advice I'm going to give you is jump in and make 200 dial or make 200 dials. If everyone makes a hundred mm -hmm. so volume negates luck. So I just started doing more than everyone else. I'd get yeah. the same results at first and then quickly it started to pay off and I became the top performing cold caller. And at that point they saw some potential and I started closing, I wanted to close, right? I started learning mm -hmm. what closing was. And they, at the time they had a personal training package. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Gym Launch, we do consulting for gyms. And then we have a smaller package, like a $4,000 package where we, we sell to personal trainers. So mm -hmm. I started selling that package, but I had to go out and hunt my own leads. So I couldn't get leads through the inbound, through the ads, that sort of thing. I had mm -hmm. to go find my own on Instagram. So I started DMing people and I quickly started closing two of those per week. Sick. And then, yeah. And then I was, I was hyped because I had no idea what was going on. Cause I just so put my wait, head. So you were doing like 200 dials a day. Mm -hmm. And then how many calls would actually pick up? So like 10 to 20 would actually okay. pick up. 
Yeah. So 10, to so 10 to 20 pick up. And yeah. then, um, and then, ten, so 10 to 20 pick up and then you get, how many offers do you get to make? So with the cold call, I was cold calling for gym owners for the team. So my job would be to set them to a conversation. Got it. So you're setter. Okay. So I was just setting. Yeah. And so I started setting them and started closing those people. And so I asked to close the big deals, which we have, you know, very high ticket program, you know, when we really get into it. And so I asked to close those and like, dude, you look 12. You look 12 months mm-hmm. Why is anyone going to take you seriously? And mm-hmm. honestly, at that time, it made me really mad. So mm-hmm. I said, okay, like, I'm just going to do the same thing I did with the personal trainers. And so I went and started DMing people like crazy on Instagram, trying to actually the first guy I closed, I sold Alex had this home gym and I started selling Alex's gym equipment before he moved out. So I sold this guy gym equipment earlier that year. And then I mm-hmm. remembered him. So I gave him a call and then mm-hmm. closed him as my first close for like the high ticket consulting package. Mm -hmm. And so it got to the point, you know, after they said, if you close one, you can be a closer. And I I went and closed one. And then I brought it back and they said, if you close three, you can be a closer. So I went, Mm -hmm. yeah, I got pissed off again. So I went and closed three and then they're like, okay, if you close five, you can be a closer. So they kept raising the bar. Yeah. Yeah. Pushing it. And then it got to the point, I think I closed two more and this was, it was probably eight months after I dropped out of college. And I just remember sitting there and the, the decision, I got the luckiest opportunity in the world because of course, Alex was supporting me through the decision. So it was a pretty easy decision, but it was still pretty tough Yeah, because everyone I knew was still in school. And so eight months later, I'm sitting in front of this document or this offer from gym launch that says ote 150k and at that time i was it was just such a moment because eight months earlier i dropped out of school had no idea what i was doing my first paycheck was 375 and then as soon as i had like a moment of this is sick i got so scared because Mm -hmm. then i had to keep the job and so then i just put my head down again and since then it's been about a year year and a half now Mm-hmm. So that's, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. I, I want to just reminisce on the cold shower phase. Cause it's just such a good, it's just such a funny thing. Um, I was doing it in, um, I was doing it in Boston in about 2017, 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, and my, typically when you're in the cold shower phase, like you have a grind and you're like probably successful at it. Like you're, you're Mm -hmm. making some thing. Um, and so I was doing it in Boston in winter and like Mm -hmm. the pipes were almost frozen. And like, I just remember, so I had my, like, I had my Epic morning playlist. Did you have Mm -hmm. that? The Epic. I just listened to Drake. (laughs) Okay. Pretty much my, what was yours? I had a playlist that I made called like songs to wake up and crush the day. And it was like the same 20 songs and they're all like basically just like positive affirmations or like, yeah. It, it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it was so fucking cold. It was like, it was like zero degrees out Fahrenheit and I was t- still taking cold showers. And that was also followed by like run in the cold mm-hmm. and snow, like with shorts on phase. Mm-hmm. Yep. Did you do anything else funny in the cold shower phase? I did. What time were you waking up? Um. Well, I think. Yeah, there was definitely all the yeah the cold shower phase is also like strict regimen. It's like wake up exactly at like seven a.m. I never had a four a.m. or like five a.m. But it it was more like wake up at seven or eight, meditate from eight. Or like when you wake up to 8.15 on the dot, read my goals from 8.15 to 8.20, get in the shower from 8.20 to 8.30. Like, yeah. Yeah. That, that so was my. That was your your routine? Uh, yeah. I did, the, I did the 4.30. So I'd wake up at 4.30, jump in the cold shower, go on a run or go to the gym, and then start start cold calling. Yeah. But 
quick quickly i realized i wasn't a morning person so i stopped yeah yeah okay and so and then the other thing i wanted to clarify is you said you looked at a page and it said ote 150 i'm sure a lot of people don't know what that means to be honest mm -hmm. i don't know what that means so what does that mean yeah. it's on target earnings <laughs> okay so, so that was what you had to earn so that would earn? if i was just making quota that's what i would earn it, it, that's what you would earn that's what i would earn yeah personally take home yep oh sick very cool okay yeah. okay so i think we've we've pretty much we've covered a lot of your story and background and all that um i mean i guess why don't you just tell a little bit more of the story from the point you got the job to uh you know dropping out and like you've been doing it for a year and a half now right so like any mm -hmm. key twists and turns along the way that you that we've skipped over i think I mean, the biggest one was just actually nailing down the position because everyone at the company is 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. So it, that was the toughest part. And then really from there, it was honestly, it's pretty boring because it's, mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> it's taking sales calls, which is fun to learn that game. But at the same time, it's, they have a saying at, you know, gym launch, like do the boring work. So it's like mm -hmm. building set and you're having the same conversations but you're getting really good at the skill set of sales so mm -hmm. i probably had three four thousand conversations throughout the last two years because there's just so much volume crammed into it where it was just 10 sometimes 12 hour days of just straight sales calls i'd have mm -hmm. days and sometimes i still do where i just don't leave my computer and just back to back to back to back to back which mm -hmm. is i feel like it's a phase that you have to go through to be able to create more leverage for yourself. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's like earn your stripes phase. Exactly. We're, we're like detailing these these phases. <laughs> what what other phases did you have? No, I had the same one. It's it's app. It's I'm building an app. Mm -hmm. It's actually I'm building an app is also typically near and around the time. I'm going to build it. I'm going to be a drop shipping millionaire or mm -hmm. I'm going to build an SMMA and be a millionaire mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that. Those are typically all around the same. And then after that is you found something that you kind of are running with. And that's like a cold shower phase, mm -hmm. um, which I think is actually also kind of the same as like the uh, it's like the earn your stripes phase. It's like like for me, that was posting YouTube videos every day. Mm. and like it, it would be like go to school film everything do homework go home 9 p.m edit until like 3 or 4 a.m and then post a video and do that like every day that was my like earn your stripes phase um so yeah yeah it's it's interesting and then i think you kind of like settle like you seem a bit more settled now i mean you're definitely still in it but it's like at least you're not waking up at 4 30 and just <laughs> inflicting pain on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I feel once you get competent enough at the skill and you get not necessarily comfortable, but you know what you're doing, then you start to realize what am I doing? Why am I doing <laughs> this? <laughs> Why don't I just do more of this thing rather yeah. than the, all the other stuff that I'm doing, wasting my time and energy. So it's, I have more mental clarity if I wake up at seven or six, like six thirty, and then just chill out for a bit before I jump into work, rather than doing all this crazy stuff and then jumping into it. What's the number one thing you've learned from Alex? So I think it was. There's a lot of things, but I think the most powerful to everyone and to myself is knowing when you start something you'll suck, and that that's okay. And the only way to get better is to do a bunch of volume as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's, I started creating content and that's the mindset I went in with it. It's mm -hmm. a, at the beginning of this stuff, I'll probably be terrible, but over a long, how good will I be in 10 years? Mm -hmm. When I started sales, I know I'm going to be bad. He said, I'm going to be bad. In a couple of years, how, how good will I actually be if I just stick to it? Because I feel mm -hmm. like, especially in the entrepreneur game, 
and just talking to some of my friends that are kind of getting in the game, they're trying all these different things very quickly. And they're all great opportunity vehicles. You just have to stick to one and know that you might suck for a couple of years, but then you'll get good. Yeah. I definitely think that's a big thing that you mentioned is like people who are just starting and looking for something to be successful in. They, mm -hmm. it's an avoidance tactic where mm -hmm. they just distract themselves with multiple different opportunities instead of just picking one because they don't want to look bad. So they just have all these ideas, the app idea, the SMMA, and it like looks and sounds good, but you really aren't having any success in anything. You're just talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said you learned a lot of things. What else? So when it comes to, I mean, what topic? Just sales? Because there's a lot of Could things. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, let's talk about sales. Let's talk about sales. Like, yeah, what's the number one thing you've learned from Alex about sales? So I think the number one thing, and these are all super simple and they're, they're pretty obvious, but I think that's the genius of Alex. Like he just, there's all these different things that you can do. What's going to be the thing that actually moves the needle the most? And so I think the biggest thing that he preaches us all the time is actually care about the person and listen to the person because then you can help them. And sometimes I think the biggest, and this is kind of trailing off a little bit, but I think the biggest mistake in sales is people jump in and they see this script or the biggest mistake in sales training or, you know, anything like that or coaching is they just try to read this script and walk people through this process. That's very unnatural. And if you actually show people, why do you have an intro? What's the objective? What's the objective, you know, of discovery of, you know, the pitch of the close? Why do you say certain things? Why would you say it like that rather than like this? Um, then you can understand the why behind things and then implement them in a natural way where you understand the person, you hear what the person's saying, and then you could use the tactics or the strategy or the, the um, outline of the call to serve the conversation and get, get the deal done or closed. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. I mean, that's all it comes down to is like, do you care about the person enough to tell them that they really need this? Mm -hmm. um, and, or maybe they don't. <laughs> yeah. And, or maybe they don't. To, you have to be able to tell them. Um, okay. What's the number one lesson you learned from Alex? Just life in general. Life in general. Hmm. He's a wise man. He's a very wise man. Life in general. I think it's the, and this sounds so lame, but it's the volume negates luck. I just think that's so yeah. powerful. It's, it's so simple, but it's so powerful and it can be applied to anything. So it's, I'm trying to think of other things that stand, stand out and are the top thing. But if you never quit, you can never lose. So if you mm -hmm. just, Think about, I think the, the next thing would be thinking about things on a long time horizon because most people try to become a millionaire in 90 days. And we went, that's, that's probably the first phase we went through, which is yeah. drop shipping, SMA. Hey, I'm just going to jump into this and 90 days later, I'm going to be the next big thing. or I'm going to build this app, become a billionaire. It doesn't work like that. It's, there's definitely, you can put yourself in a situation where you do get lucky and you hit that stride but it's all about the skill sets that you build. So mm -hmm. when you jump in and this is, you know, just kind of my opinion, what I've heard is if you look at your, your path or entrepreneurial journey as almost a pyramid and the base layers, the skill sets you build and the wider you build the base, the higher the peak, because if I just have this one skill that sales, then my peak's just going to be this high. But if I build sales, mm -hmm. leadership, content, whatever now yeah. my peak can be so much higher because i'm so much more valuable to the marketplace yeah that's good and that's good um what about wealth preservation and like financial management because you're 21 now most 21 mm -hmm. year olds i know me and it's honestly something i still like grapple with 
like when you start making a lot of money, the temptation to just spend it on dumb shit or just spend it on whatever you feel like spending it is very mm-hmm. high. But you kind of strike me as someone who doesn't really do that that much, or at least I don't know. There's something. Maybe you didn't learn it from Alex. Maybe it was your parents taught you. But what what would you have? What are your thoughts on that? And making your first big money and like treating it well. Yep. So great question. My belief, I'll get into this in a second. My belief on this actually shifted two weeks ago, actually having a conversation with Alex. But if you, when you start making a lot of money and you just look at your bank account or download, do you know the app Mint? Yeah. Yeah. An app like that where you can just track all your investments and you know, your bank accounts and all that sort of thing. And if you get obsessed with seeing that number grow, then it's pretty easy to save money, right? And it's it's also about who you surround yourself with. So when I dropped out of school, it was just me and, you know, I got fortunate. I had a couple of buddies from high school drop out with me. So we all had this house. And so we were all cheap, all super cheap, right? And so it kind of just instilled in me, okay, if I make X amount per month and I only spend 2000 all this money is going to my bank account, right? So I think it's who you surround yourself with, which is getting harder as I'm networking with people who are just doing crazy stuff. And then also, if you get obsessed with the game of seeing your bank account go up and you check that every day, then it's almost like a scoreboard. So then when you go right. spend a bunch of money, you see it drop and you kind of get a little irritated because then you have to go in and like continue to raise the scoreboard, right? Yeah. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's... I've never really heard that mindset on either. That's good. It's, how do you what, like, like, how did you, was that kind of just like who came up with that idea? That was just you like on your own or the idea of like your finances kind of is like a, your own personal scoreboard. Yeah. So I think the idea of my finances is own personal scoreboard. That was, I just came up with that after checking it with, nothing in there and then when i started yeah. seeing i'm like this is sick this is cool mm-hmm. and then i also think it was a mix of being of course mentored under alex so i didn't want to go like make this money and then he see me buy dumb stuff <laughs> so, that, let's be honest that was probably the driving yeah, motivator. that was that was probably the biggest driving motivator and then it turned yeah. into kind of money. yeah i relate to that because i think that's something that i've maybe been lacking um just with some of the mentors i've had in the past because they were actually encouraging me to spend a lot Mm -hmm. and i mean don't get me wrong like especially for what i do spending money pays off in just life experiences and in wisdom and Mm -hmm. like you know the fact that i've lived in the hollywood hills in you know a mini mansion like I have that life experience and I can tell people about it. And I also know, like, is that something that I would ever really want in the future? So I don't know. There, there's different forms of wealth, but I definitely want to be more in the phase uh, of like saving more so now. So that's, that's really cool. I like that. Yeah. And I, that, that's the thing. And that's what's shifted over the last couple of weeks. Cause I was, I went to dinner with Alex two weeks ago and we we're just talking and he said, the money you're making right now is not going to make you wealthy. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, you get wealthy by building something great. You're building a mm-hmm. skill set right now. Yeah. So I think it's through this, this habit. I like just having money in my bank account. Cause it's just nice. But at the same time, even I feel like the money we're making now isn't, we're just still building skill sets. We're just packing these skill sets down and then yeah, yeah. money also follows attention with what yeah. you do. So it's, it pays off and you're having sick experiences. So yeah, I, my belief is shifting on it. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah, it's, it's probably something you want to measure closely, but no, I, I fully agree with that. I mean, that's another thing I felt is like, I'm making a, I'm making a lot of money like relative to, you know, other people my age are on average making, but I still in my core know, like, even if I make, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in the span of a few days, it's just mm-hmm. like pretty soon. And just cause I honestly, a lot of it, and we'll talk about Iman a little bit, 
Like a lot mm -hmm. of it is just fucking Elon, like knowing what's possible and yeah. just knowing that you can make, you know, half a million in a day is just like, okay, well, why am I stressing about 10 grand? Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. Um, like, like it should be 10 grand every couple hours, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. 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 So well, let's talk about that because, you know, we're here on this podcast, but people probably don't know how we met. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I mean, I guess I knew about you just through, cause Alex had mentioned like my 19 year old neighbor is like good content, like him speaking to kind of the 19 year olds out there. Um, and just your relationship that you have with him. So I knew you a little bit, but then we met through Jen's croquet club, which is, um, Iman Gadji's project. And it's essentially just a modern day young gentleman's club. Um, and we learn things and we share ideas and we meet each other and we network and um and yeah i mean what, what are your thoughts on the gents for club great investment great investment it's sick so it's it's just cool to be be able to connect with a bunch of people in the group especially mm -hmm. when iman hops on the call mm -hmm. like that's crazy and how, how was that event by the way oh the live event yeah where we played croquet yeah, yeah that was fun <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You might I got to, I, I want to come to the next one. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's sweet, man. I'm, I'm excited. I, I remember just seeing the YouTube video on it and then I just went and applied for it and then went through the process. And I think I almost missed the call for it because I was, I was traveling. And so <laughs> I knew I couldn't miss it. So I answered, answered it in the airport. I'm like, Hey, I'm so sorry. I'm in the airport. I hate when people take calls, you know, when they're on their phone in the airport, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I apologize. And then, yeah, man, one thing led to the next and it's, it's a dope group. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, Pete, shout out Pete, who basically runs the project alongside Iman. Mm -hmm. um, Pete's amazing. What else? What else is there to say about it? I mean, it's kind of it's it's really still in its infancy. I don't think people realize like how powerful it's going to become over time. Mm. Like just with like everything, everything they're building is just and relative to what else is out there, especially in the NFT marketplace. Like there's quite literally nothing out there that could at all compare to it. There's nothing like it. When I when I heard the idea, I wasn't into cryptos or NFT that, like that much. And so when I heard the utility of it, I was, this is what it's meant for. And then I honestly, after that, I had a whole, I had a whole nother little phase for like two weeks where I said, I'm going to start an NFT ticketing company. <laughs> so I had that phase. I don't know I if you've had, had your I had phase yet. I, I launched an NFT. You did? No, I don't want to well, talk about it. You can skip that. Okay. <laughs> no we can talk about it it's fine um i just i got like really excited about it and you know what i you know what's like a big mind fuck with it is like you see like iman's just doing it correctly and mm -hmm. there's so much idiot idiocy in the space and like there's this really talented apparently i don't even know is he talented there's this guy uh murat pack mm -hmm. p-a-k murat pack on twitter m-u-r-a-t-p-a-k might have heard about it. Basically, in, in December, I was in Miami for Art Basel. And I was with my friend Justin Liao and some of his other friends. And he was like all excited about this pack drop. And it was an NFT drop. And basically what it is, is it's, I could actually screen share. It's digital blobs. Digital blobs. What do you mean? Well, just say it with me. Digital blob. Digital blob. Digital blob. Yeah. So basically, uh, also, I don't know if I'm echoing. I, I hope that my, I feel like I'm echoing on your computer a little bit. It, I can turn you down maybe. Yeah, turn know. me down a little bit. Yeah. Is that better? Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Digital blob. Okay. The fungible collection by pack. 
So basically, this artist released digital blobs. I'm trying to pull up a good picture of it. And yeah, here. Okay. <laughs> so basically, what you would do is you could buy or you could mint or something. You could you could buy these digital blobs, which looked like this. And basically, like, the more you bought, the more you had. And there were, like, 237. And, like, the more you bought, there was, like, the bigger your mass would get. So they'd, and, they'd come together? Yeah, they would come together, yeah. And so if you read this, so artists sold 266,000 shares of NFT, $91.8 million dollars. So he, he made $91 million in one mint. That's crazy. So this inspired you? Yeah, because I was like, well, he didn't do anything. Like, <laughs> like, he just made blobs. I was like, this must be the ticket. So I didn't, I mean, I basically, what I tried to do is, it was sort of similar to GCC. I just wanted to like make my, like make like a high level mastermind um and just have it as an NFT. And I found some kid that, no, you know what? I think the idea came to me because some kid like DM'd me and was like, hey, like you should make an NFT. I was like, how do I do that? He was like, it's easy. I'll show you. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And then like three day turnaround launched an NFT and like no one minted because it was just like way too expensive. And I didn't explain it. And it was, I don't, we can skip that topic. Well, it's fine. Wait, wait, it's like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I got to ask this question. If you made 90, if you made 91 mil, yeah. Off, say you did it and it made 91 mil, what would yeah. you do? Like, what would I would have kept doing what I'm doing, but I would have just, yeah, I would have definitely just kept doing what I'm doing. Of course. Like, I would just make a sick program and. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would probably like buy some real estate and stuff like that, but I like what I do a lot. Like this is, it's fun for me. So I would just no, do it at a, at a, I'd, I'd build like a whole, I don't know, like a whole studio and yeah. That'd be Why, what would you do? If I got 91 million? Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea what I do. I think I would try to, I'd definitely jump into the education space and i i think college is just it's just such a scam at this point like there's no return on investment so i'd try to help out with that yeah somehow through figuring out a way how to tackle it because it's such a huge space i think you're going to i think honestly everyone in in gcc is going to in some way um i wanted to bring up a point about iman as well i think one of my favorite things that iman has said i don't know if he said it to me or he said it publicly but he said like his his goal in particularly like the SMMA space that he's in mm -hmm. is not to like beat the competition, it's to embarrass the competition. Mm -hmm. And so like when I like when I hear him say that, and then I remember the day, I don't know if you uh, saw his Instagram the day that he made like or that his business made like six hundred thousand dollars in a day. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my Stripe account for for my businesses and I was like wow <laughs> like like i'm not even in his industry like i'm not in the space but i'm embarrassed like this is very mm -hmm. embarrassing um so i actually feel like the same thing is just going to happen with gcc like i just feel like board ape proof collective like everyone does ha they have no idea like what iman and i'd like to say that we all are building mm -hmm. um and it's just like it's going to be really funny when like kind of the nft world realizes what is happening because they don't know yet it's just so much value and he yeah. does throughout all his businesses he has so much class about them yeah and he does them right so i'm i'm really excited to see what it turns into yeah it's just like an infinitely growing value machine um and people have no idea like they just don't know how valuable it even that, even how valuable it is right now, it's so underpriced. Mm -hmm. Like, it's funny to think that you can get in GCC for like, what is it? Like two ETH or, or no, like eight ETH right now or four ETH. I don't know. It's like eight or 10 grand. Mm -hmm. And like, there's kids out there who are considering, who are considering like, you know, paying 
committing to $350,000 for college. It's crazy. Everything you need for an opportunity would be in that group. And this is what it, I made a video about this, but it, it irritates me. And granted there's, there's definitely connections that come from college, especially if you go to a very nice university or very like wealthy university, but you can also spend eight to 10 grand, get in a group like that, provide value to people. And then even if you're brand new and don't have much value to provide, there's going to be someone in there with an agency that needs a salesperson. And mm -hmm. then you just say, Hey, let me cold call, learn how to sell. And then you can build a skill set that can make you hundreds of thousands of dollars rather than spending four years in school and then hoping drinking beer with someone will get you a connection that will change your life. Right. Mm -hmm. it's like connections. You you're have much to more likely, You're much more likely to meet the guy in college. Who's going to tell you your app idea is worth 250 grand. <laughs> and, <laughs> Then to find someone who's going to, I don't know, invite you on a podcast or give you a job, like a real job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. So yeah, GCC is epic. Shout out, um, shout out Jordan Welch in the chat. I don't know if you know Jordan. Um, actually, oh, he's in here? Yeah, That's do you know dope. Jordan? Yeah, I've, I've been watching his YouTube stuff. I don't know him though, personally. Oh yeah. He was out in London um, when I went out there in May. And he's like a Jordan's a really fucking good dude. Like Jordan's like very top quality guy. Like he's the kind of guy who like he really takes care of everyone around him. Mm -hmm. Um, from his filmer, um, who was actually also there, is a really awesome dude as well. And um, yeah, he, he's Jordan's a really good dude. Shout out Jordan if you're still here. Um, I was I was watching a ahead. podcast with him. It was him, Iman, and a bunch of other people. Just crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you see that? I didn't watch it, but I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, that dude, like, there's a generation that is, like, our generation that is just, like, so sneaky, intelligent, and powerful. And um, I think the whole, like, content redistribution thing that Iman's doing, like, a lot of us are going to follow in those footsteps. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's what Tate did, but without the affiliate um affiliate model and like i like i see where my where my content is going and you know it, it's just going to be like it's good stuff man i think we're kind of heading more into you know what we should head into now let's get into like the whole spiritual war side of spiritual warfare side of things we can talk about social stuff as well but mm -hmm. like the intro to my um videos on tribe accelerator the youtube channel is a quote from have you seen the movie um, Fight Club? Mm -hmm. Yep. There's a quote from Tyler Durden, and he says, um, our great war is a spiritual war. And it's like, it's just, I love thinking about this because it just gets me, it gets me so fired up and excited. And like, it, it is, dude. Like, we, I mean, perhaps there will be, I mean, there is a war in Ukraine, Right. Mm -hmm. But like, whereas, you know, our grandparents and parents and whatever were getting drafted and put into Vietnam or like, you know, World War Two or whatever, like our war is happening right now. Like we are fighting it as we're doing this podcast mm -hmm. and and like working on stuff like GCC and like, you know, building education companies and, and inspiring the youth to like think for themselves and pursue your own path like this, like our battle that we are fighting is this. Mm -hmm. And I like, I think the more we can wake young guys up to this and women, um, mm -hmm. just the more like the more good we're going to see in the world, because there's just a lot of uh, weird shit at the top that seems to be having an agenda. And I feel like, you know, we're the, we're the people we're the guys with the intelligence and strategy to kind of just completely overrun that. And I actually think it'll happen in the next, you know, three to six years where it's like a complete kind of revolution of it sounds, it's going to sound weird, but just like light, just like mm -hmm. lighter energy, like better energy, con like consuming, you know, consuming the world. I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, just the, the whole Tate thing was cool to see, just to see how, like, he, what he was, the, the main messages that he was spreading were 
net good. Um, and now seeing kind of Iman double down on that and mm-hmm. like his content team is just expanding and like, he's such a positive role model, um, you know, to young guys out there. And I like, I don't, it, it gets me excited, man. Like our war is it's, this is it. Like we're fighting it now. We're the frontline warriors, you know, and it's, we're not like have a, a, a gun in our hands. I mean, some, some of our friends I'm sure do, but this is the battle. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know. What are your thoughts? I agree. And I think it's, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how people don't see that they're being put into a path that typically doesn't serve them. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know. It's so obvious to me where you go to school, you get in a ton of debt. Most people don't pay off their debt till they're 40, 45. And typically they don't even work in the field. They got their degree in. So it just, like on that side of things, and that's, I guess, the lens I'm looking at at it now at this time is I just don't know how you don't see that there's probably people pulling the strings and we're probably in some sort of system mm-hmm. to be controlled to a degree. And it's uh, how do you how do you break out of that? And that's just, I guess, learning skill sets that are valuable where you can Mm -hmm. do the stuff you like to do. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. (laughs) Um, I'm looking at our notes here. If there's anything specific, you said you wanted to pick my brain on conspiracy theories. I've just been seeing your, I watched that. I watched that movie you sent to the chat. The zeitgeist. Yeah. 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 So I didn't, I want to, and I've been seeing your stories. So have you been going into the rabbit hole lately? In- yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've just like, my background on it is just, um, I had like a lot of anxiety and, and I couldn't sleep at night insomnia. And when I was like 14, 15, I had like kind of an awakening, anxious anxiety, like moment and just like realization of my own existence and consciousness. And that like one year, having an awakening like a spiritual awakening it typically is like difficult at first it's like a it's like a um caterpillar turning into a butterfly like if you ever see a video it's not pretty it looks very painful and so that's Mm -hmm. kind of the period i went through when i was like 15 um when i when i did the interview with iman he said he went through that at like seven years old which is crazy to me but i went Mm -hmm. through it at like 14 or 15 and i started to just have a lot of questions about everything and it was definitely like kind of a darker time but around the time i was like 18 it sort of just lightened and i started to just notice why i'd gotten so anxious and depressed and i one of the main things to me was that every night we would watch my parents would throw on cnn Mm -hmm. and i when i was like 18 i was just like wait this is just all negative mental reprogramming. Cause I started learning about Mm -hmm. um, neuroplasticity and like how to train your brain. And I just realized that the news is just a mental reprogramming tool for whoever owns the news media to um, put people in a state of fear to, uh, to, I mean, it's, I talked about it on the last podcast with soul bra, but it's just like there, there's an event that happens, whether it's real or completely made up um, mm-hmm. or or orchestrated that puts people in a state of fear or like they have to take action against something and then that allows for policies to be put in place that exert more control over people or that raise taxes mm-hmm. or that just make people basically more slaves and more easily controlled i just started seeing all that i mean i think like the main thing i didn't realize all that initially the first realization was just like wait, why is like the news will, it's like 20, 30 minute segment and mm-hmm. like 28 minutes of the segment is either negative news or a commercial from a pharmaceutical company about this like pill that you should take or this medicine that you should take and anti-depression. And like, that's just what people are consuming every single night. Mm-hmm. And the other two minutes is like, 
And in, in good news, this man helped this woman, this old lady, cross the street. And that's it. Yeah. And then it goes back into the, the fear and, and everything. And um, so, yeah, that was my, my initial just reaction to it all. Uh, and, and then I started getting, that's kind of like what followed. That was just before the whole like cold shower phase. Cause I was like, Oh, I have to like, honestly, you know what the cold shower phase might be? It's kind mm -hmm. of, it's going to sound kind of, this is a little bit like conspiracy ish, but I think it's fully real. I think a bit of it is, uh, unprogramming yourself. And like, you have to in, almost like inflict the pain to just zap out all of the negative programming that's in you. Um, someone sent me a thread after what everything I posted last night mm -hmm. and it was about like the whole idea of like a, the deal. Actually, you know what? Let's pull this up. This is, this is great. Let's do it. When did you, <laughs> uh, when did you have the epiphany where, where it went from, where it went from you thinking you, you realizing these things to realizing maybe it is like a game plan or something actually that's done on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I didn't actually at first think that there was like a agenda. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't connect the dots of like, Oh, the pharmaceutical companies are profiting from the negative media and like pushing people into improper health plans and like getting people unhealthy makes people sick and then they buy the medication. Oh, I didn't like that took me. I didn't realize that until honestly, yeah, I don't think I connected the dots until the pandemic. That's when it hit. I Yeah, I always knew like pharmaceutical companies were just bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and don't get me wrong. Like, there definitely are some medications that are good. Like every everything that there's no like absolute truths other than, of course, the one truth that is God. But, you know, but like, you know, there obviously are like some medicines that are good. And I actually even think like some people probably should have gotten the vaccine. Like the C word wasn't completely made up, you know, mm -hmm. like it is a real thing. People did die. But, um, you know, I, I also I started to realize like how much belief like human belief has an effect on reality. Yep. So like you can take something that's somewhat real and make it even more real by just believing in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. So, so yeah, I don't think it was on, I think it was like when the pandemic hit and that's when I kind of the whole, I guess like curtains started to fall for me where I was like, okay, I've been skeptical of all this stuff. I stopped watching the news a long time ago. Every time I would go home from college, my parents were watching the news. I would turn it off. I'd be like, guys, no more watching this. Like, not while I'm home. This is, this is demon. Like this is, I didn't even think, I didn't think it was demon stuff at the time. Now I kind of do, but like, <laughs> but back then I was just like, this is just bullshit. It's just negative. Mm -hmm. um, I got my my dad, another big part is my dad. My dad was on antidepressants for 15 years. And he was mm -hmm. like, you know, he was very depressed for a long time and had a uh, bipolar depression. And so I kind of grew up seeing that a bit. Um, but I introduced him to like, after I started learning all this stuff, I introduced him to just like journaling in the morning and mm -hmm. Eckhart Tolle and meditation and then within like two or three months i think it was just like one summer of kind of showing him this stuff completely off his his uh depression medicine and happy as can be and i like that for me like my dad is he's 71 now but it's just like mm -hmm. like doctors don't solve root cause they just follow orders that they're given mm -hmm. basically by these trillion dollar institutions to make more money so okay, let me let me show you this thread, because um, this is someone sent me this this morning and I was reading it and it was just like, whoa. Um, what's funny too is like you can't deny this stuff. Like everything I was posting last night, like what what are you gonna say? Like the fact that people do this, mm -hmm. like how like so many artists and celebrities are doing like what? How could you? say that that's something other than some like conspiratorial thing. I don't have a good argument against it. So. <laughs> like how, what, what else <laughs> I, put it? I mean, explain it to me. Like I'm looking to be convinced, but um, let me see. And it could okay. be, 
it could be a thing, but not to what degree we think it is. Like they could yeah. just have a club. And then a lot of the times the unknown or imagination sometimes will make it a lot crazier than it is. But who knows? I, I haven't done a ton of research into it. Yeah. I'm actually curious what Alex's thoughts are on this. <laughs> Let's get him on here. Can you call him up? Alex, what do you think about it? <laughs> hey, what, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, so selling your soul a thread. Sign here. You may have heard of the idea of making a deal with the devil or selling your soul, but what does this mean? Is it merely a metaphor or is it something someone can literally do? And who is the devil? Is he a real entity with horns or symbolic representation of something else? The idea of selling your soul was popularized by the tragedy Dr. Faustus. In the play, a man who is dissatisfied with life offers his soul to Lucifer in exchange for magical powers. Some say actual demons once appeared on stage during a performance, driving spectators mad. Some scholars claim Dr. Faustus was based on the real-life mathematician and inventor John Dee. While he was undoubtedly a genius, he ruined his reputation among the scientific community when he claimed he figured out how to contact spirits. John Dee's magical research would later inspire Jack Parsons, a rocket scientist and co-founder of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to attempt co to contact spirits as well. So the idea of magic and demons may sound like fiction, but many intelligent people take it seriously. Philosopher Manny P. Hall once wrote, it is possible to make contracts with the spirits whereby the magician becomes the master of an, an elemental being. True black magic is performed with the aid of a demonic spirit who serves the magician for the length of his earthly life. It is possible then that some illusionists, illusionists are actually using, or is it possible that some illusionists are actually using black magic? While many of them are unquestionably very talented, some tricks certain illusionists perform seem impossible to do without supernatural aid. Some illusionists even admit to having help. For example, you might remember Mike Super, the Mr. Fire from America's Got Talent. He claimed he was only able to perform such amazing tricks because of his spirit Desmond. Can you hear this? I don't like when people call me yep. a magician. Okay. Because I'm not using a deck of cards. I'm not using a big box on stage. I like to get into people's minds and also involve uh, the spirit world a little bit, which freaks people out. It's great. What kind of tricks are you going to Oh, my God. I am don't think I'm crazy at the end of this. I'm doing a thing with a, a spirit tonight, so, uh, and hopefully it works. In my, in my childhood, I had a supernatural spirit attached to me. His name is Desmond. I... So that's kind of weird. I actually kind of want to see what he did. Wait, what? What is going yeah. on? <laughs> yeah, is that weird? Is that like a joke or? Um, well, he was on America's Got Talent and he did. Uh, let me see. I'm, I want to see what he actually. Oh, I just got my own ad, dude. That's sick. Do you hear that? Hold on. Oh, this is great. I just got my own ad. I've been getting your ads like crazy. Let's go. Where is it? Same old routine. Yeah. Because I was exactly. All right, Mike. We are ready for you. Come on out. Thing with Desmond today that I've never tried. Desmond is your, if I remember correctly, your imaginary friend. Yeah, I can understand why you say that. Yes, uh, he's my spirit energy uh, that I've sort of had a little communication with uh, throughout my life. So they say I'm crazy. <laughs> Have a seat. So here's what we're going to do. I have here a piece of chalk. Yes. Howie, hold that chalk. Right. As you do, I want you to think of somebody you have an emotional connection with. Okay. Okay. Don't say it. All right. Just the first name. Okay. Somebody I couldn't possibly know. Okay. All right. Now, I have here two blank chalkboards. Okay. I'm using chalkboards. That way you know it's analog. There's no Dude, it's creepy. I don't like it. Yeah, this is weird. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't even know what's going on. I, I don't like it. Okay, so what does he do? Give him those slates. Desmond for Howie. Desmond! You were thinking of a name. I yes. was. No way I could know. I no can't way. imagine For you the do. first time, name the name you were merely thinking of for Desmond. Steve. Steve. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Howie, hold on to that. Truly no way I could have known, but I want you guys to take a close look at these numbers because this is a Zodiac calendar. 
Nick gave us a number 20. Dude, the Zodiac. They talked about that in the zeitgeist. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It all Three, connects. Right? It all right. connects. These look like uh-huh. random numbers, but it's not. 3 plus 11 is 14, plus 5 is 19, plus 4 is 23, the number Nick gave us. 1 plus 8 is 9, plus 10 is 19, plus 4 is 23. Each row adds up to 23 if you look closely. Howard, what month were you born? January. January, that's 1. You see, Howard's month is right there. What month were you born, Heidi? June. June, uh, that is a 6 uh, right there. Mel B, what May, month? May, 5. 5. Howie? What month were you born? November. November. 11. That is 11. Check it out. 11 plus 1 is 12. Plus 5? 17. Plus 6? 23. 23. 23. Desmond <laughs> has created a Zodiac calendar based off of your We Have Had contact. Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know what that was, but <laughs> kind of weird. So, like, what's the overall conspiracy or theory in that? that thread oh um hold on let me let me just we can like kind of pan through it um because it, it brings it more to like modern day um uh, but could have a spirit help you with other abilities some musicians claim that when they start performing something else takes over them many also claim that hey they have a deal with the devil in exchange for fortune and fame one of the first musicians to say they sold their soul was giuseppe Tart- tartini who wrote the famous devil's trill sonata after having a dream about the devil later niccolo P- Paganini, arguably the best violin violinist to ever play, would be accused of the same thing. Eventually, the deal with the devil motive became made its way into blues. Robert Johnson, the most prolific artist in the genre, saying about selling his soul to, at a crossroads at midnight. Before this supposed event, he was notoriously terrible at guitar. Um, <laughs> jazz singers like Sammy Davis and Frank Sinatra were also members of the Church of Satan. Uh, Elvis Presley. Um, once a gospel churchgoer said he was said to be obsessed with strange spiritual teachings toward the end of his life. Okay, this part's this part's wild. Elvis helped pave the way to rock and roll, which soon became known as devil's music. Is it possible that all these artists were really getting help from demonic spirits? Bob Dylan has been quoted saying he only got where he is because of a bargain he made a long time ago. Go out here doing these songs. You know, you're still on tour. I do, but I don't take it for granted. Why do you still do it? Why are you still out here? Well, it goes back to the destiny thing. I, mean, I made a bargain with it, you know, a long time ago, and I'm holding up my hand. What was your bargain? To get where um, I am now. Sh- should I ask who you made the bargain with? <laughs> with, 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 you know, with the chief, uh, chief commander. On this earth? <laughs> and on this earth and then uh, and then in the world we can't see. Go out here door. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that's weird. This is all weird. Led <laughs> <laughs> Zeppelin. I'm trying to follow. The Beatles were also inspired by Crowley, who's said to be the wickedest man in the world. There are many strange conspiracies around the Beatles. One that Paul was used as a satanic sacrifice and replaced with a lookalike. Um, musicians... Many musicians today make similar claims and are subject to similar conspiracy theories. Katy Perry has said during an interview that she has sold her soul to the devil. And like Paul, many musicians are also rumored to have been replaced by lookalikes or clones. Didn't you release a CD like almost 10 years ago? Um, Yeah, I mean, I released a gospel record when I was 15 um, because I grew up in, uh, you know, a household where all I ever did was listen to gospel music and my parents are both traveling ministers. And so... I kind of sang about, you know, what was going on in my life at 15. And that's how I got introduced to the music industry. I swear I wanted to be like the Amy Grant of music. Yeah. <laughs> but it didn't work out. And so I sold my soul to the devil. <laughs> sold my soul to the devil. Didn't it? Weird. Um, are these musicians being helped by demons or just something sinister going on? What exactly is the deal entail? When an artist signs a contract that gives a label the right to a person's image, does that mean... They get the right to recreate it, even if after they are dead. What happens if an artist no longer, sorry, no longer wants to comply? Um, are they simply sacrificed and replaced? Perhaps it's last report. This is crazy, dude. Like the whole free bit Britney thing. I just didn't even think about it. But like Britney Spears kind of went off the rocker. But did she really? I don't know. I don't. Um, 
what if what if medication is not enough? Lady Gaga, and Nicki Minaj, Beyonce, and countless others claim they have alter egos that take over whenever they perform. Perhaps they're not spirits, but symptoms of MK Ultra programming. Perhaps these two things are one and the same. MK Ultra programming. MK Ultra was a program carried out by the CIA in order to develop methods of mind control using psychoactive drugs, electroshock, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, sexual abuse, and even torture. Some say black magic and witchcraft were also methods they explored. Perhaps when a person's psyche is shattered, spirits can more easily control an individual. There are many instances when celebrities glitch out where their alter egos take over their programming and they seem to fail. These celebrities, these celebrities, these same celebrities heavily promote MK Ultra symbolism. That's Lady Gaga. She's like short circuiting. Hmm. Um, dude, yeah, like, see that? That's like a, that's a symbol, like this hand thing here. Dude, it's the hands so, together? Yeah, the hands together like like that is like a Masonic thing. I don't know. I don't know a lot about this stuff. I'm just like, I just see it. All the, like, I go to like Post Malone last night and I'm just look. I'm like, all right, like what are, who's, like what's happening here, you know? And I think the Post Malone was actually good. It was like a good energy. But then afterward, I don't know. I just, I see it. You see it everywhere. So how can you not think about this? This is kind of another thing I'm mind blown by. Like, it's just everywhere. How could you possibly not be fascinated by this? I love how you go to Post Malone and that's where your brain goes. <laughs> Dude, like, well, look, like, I mean, every, like, Michael it's Jackson, cool. like, he's, he was calling it out and then he died. And then Prince started calling it out and then he died. And then Kanye, another artist who claims to have sold a soul, seems to be another case of someone who feels cheated and is no longer willing to keep up his end of the deal. It seems a meltdown or symptoms of failed programming. Kim Kardashian is rumored to be Kanye's handler. <laughs> Even mm. more strange is the fact that Kanye is attempting to turn his life over to God while most of the um, Kardashian family claims to practice witchcraft. Is the devil using them to keep Kanye under a spell? Another oddity is the fact that Kanye seems to predict his current situation in the song Gold Digger. My psychic told me she has an ass like Serena. She got one of your kids, got you for 18 years. She went the she went to the doctor, got lipo with your money. So are all these people going to hell? Um, I think like the way it sort of turns out just to save some time is like, basically it's not necessarily like a super, I mean, I think there is super dark stuff that's happening, but mm -hmm. a lot of it is just like, we all have our own demons, literally, like we have our own struggles and hard times that we go through and we can you know fuel use those as fuel for good and they kind of make us creative and etc cetera, etc cetera. yep and that, i think you have a choice when that happens or you go through a dark time of are you going to let it control you or are you going to control it mm -hmm. like are you it's the victim versus victor mindset how do you how do you channel your dark energy um i think i just It's figuring out how to, like, what's the outcome that I want? And it does this energy, where does this energy serve me best? Right. Mm -hmm. Does it serve me? And then just picking the activities because, you know, if you're feeling depressed or whatever it might be, and you don't start taking some sort of action on something, then you're mm -hmm. just going to feel that way. Or you can go down that spiral because that energy is going to go somewhere unless you, it's just almost about being selfish and then mm -hmm. figuring out does this serve me or not? And then asking those questions as you go through something that's hard and then just picking the things that serve your long-term self best. Is there like a particular like dark time in your life or like, I don't know, anything specifically that you is like Jacob's demons? I think it's perspective because I, I've been very fortunate but like the, the worst time was definitely that period when I was losing the money. Like I was losing all the money from doing the wholesaling. Mm -hmm. I got, I had a final in school. I got caught cheating on. So I got caught <laughs> cheating on that. <laughs> I was losing like three, 4,000 per month. And then I, 
I was so isolated because in my house, I lived in kind of this separate side or just a single room. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really even interact with my family that much. All my friends were at school. I'd be constantly on social media, seeing them posting at parties, doing all this stuff. So it was, I guess I just felt like pretty lonely during mm -hmm. that time. And I think that's what I honestly got like pretty depressed during that time. And then that's, it took me a couple of weeks to realize that if I don't start trying to pursue what I need to pursue, then I'm just going to feel like this forever. Mm -hmm. Or it almost felt that way. And you wanted to ask me about like social circle stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you mentioned was like building a social circle for college dropouts. Yeah, I think that would be huge because I get that. I have people DM me and they're like, hey, I want to drop out of school, but I don't know how I'm going to have friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of location helps. Like if you're in a larger city like LA or New York or Miami or, you know, any, any major city around the world, it's just there's so many people. You're bound to find people that click with you. If you're in like a small town, like I was, I, I was raised in a town with like 35,000 people, which definitely isn't that big. Um, so if you have a smaller town, it's a bit more difficult, but then the answer is just online. Um, I think the roadmap I would give to your younger self, I mean, you did it right. Like you had friends that dropped out with you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I, what I did is I had some friends that dropped out with me and then I moved to UT campus in Austin. So I lived on the, like on the outskirts of the college campus where every, all the college kids lived. So that's just what I did. So it was yeah, moving near a college is smart. Yeah. You, yeah. You can well, do that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I didn't end up, I had a couple friends, you know, that went to the school that I'd hang out with every once in a while, but then it's almost, you're on such a different path that it becomes hard to relate. One second. This might be my movers. <laughs> you're good. Hello. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Let me see. Um, I think I did. Um, give me a second. Sorry, Brian. You're all good. Um, let's see. Okay, I got it. Uh, you said I'll have a better timetable in an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, also, I need the address. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll text you right back. Okay, yeah, it's it's 50 Causeway Street. 50 Causeway Street. The, the building is called Hub 50 House. Uh, it's right next to the Boston Garden. Okay. All right, so around 2 p.m.? Yeah, I'll keep you posted. Okay. All right, thank you, Brian. I'll, I'll text you um, uh, just everything to make sure that you have everything you need. Okay. All right, thanks, Brian. All right, bye. Apologies on that. All good. Yeah, movers are coming to move me out of my apartment. I just dropped my address, but I'm not living here anymore, so it's fine. Um <laughs> Are you moving? So you're moving to LA? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly where yet, but that's the current plan. Um, so just going to peruse around. Um, but yeah, I mean, like location is a big thing. Kind of thinking about where you're going to live is important. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people who want to make friends think about it that much, but it's like, you know, if you want to go down a more entrepreneurial route, then move somewhere where there's going to be a lot of people in that same mindset and it'll be relatively easy to, to meet people. Um, also online communities are huge. Like Jensko K club is kind of a shortcut. Um, obviously the network that I built with tribe accelerator is a shortcut. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you can just get immediate access to really the, the easiest, the, the, here's the secret. It's pick a skill set. This is for men specifically, but mm -hmm. it's pick a skill set. Um, start getting really good at it, join an online community or two that 
is in the general vicinity, general niche related to that skill set. So like online business, you know, sales, whatever it is, and then move to a larger city um, where there's going to people who be people who are also interested in that. And then within those online communities, look for the person who already has their social life figured out and just become just become friends with them. Mm -hmm. So like when I moved back to Boston in 2019, um, I met my friend Jordan, who's also co-founder of Hubi with my current roommate, Kasson. And they mm -hmm. were going out like three or four nights a week. They already had a group of like 30 people that they were friends with. And I mm -hmm. kind of just like became a part of that friend group instead of having to like figure it out on my own and plan dinners and events and parties on my own. I just was like, oh, there's someone that's already having the parties and the dinners and I just need to be a part of that circle. So most cities have a, a person that kind of leads that group or multiple. And you just have to figure out who that is in your city and then just start getting invited to things. Mm -hmm. That's like a, a big thing that I tackle in, in Tribe Accelerator with, with what I help guys with, but um that's it it's just outsource it you don't have to build it from scratch yeah 100 percent. so build build a skill set join community with skill set make some money move to a big city and then connect with other the glue guy that you talk about find your the glue, glue guy, guy. Find that's, glue that's guy. literally it every city has multiple glue guys the glue guy's the person that has the social side of everything figured out and that's it and how do you um, Go ahead. How do you stay focused? Cause you travel a ton. So yeah. I've been traveling, you know, a lot more over the past year and I can still work and everything. And, you know, of course, if you're doing high ticket sales, it's all virtual, but how do you stay locked in and focused on growing and scaling your business when you're traveling? So there's a couple different ways to answer it. I mean, when you have a, a, job like what you've had it's definitely more difficult because mm -hmm. like the the saying is like do the boring work mm -hmm. um you know for for me and the way that i've built my business it's kind of like i'm always in a position where like yes there is boring work but the majority of what i'm doing is actually like super fun like mm -hmm. i would record this podcast if i was anywhere in the world and it, you wouldn't have to motivate me like it's just yep. fun for me to do um and so like the act of I think like as you build more skill sets and you start to get leverage with like hiring mm -hmm. um, and, you know, getting other people who are better than you at that thing that you used to have to do um, and who actually enjoy doing that thing. Yep. Um, you just get to position yourself in the company as either just the builder or just wherever you want to be in the company where it's like your, your state of flow. And also, especially when you start building a brand and you, you like, this is kind of a, a spiritual thing too that we're like uh, kind of keep finding ourselves diving back into. But um, I actually used to do this. It's weird to, weird to think about, but when I was making YouTube videos every day, I had a written goal card and I learned it from Napoleon Hill. And, you know, I would like, it was really draining. Like, um, going to, uh, I, I had a job. It was either I had a job or school. So I would mm -hmm. like go to work. And then after that I would film videos or if I was at school, I'd film videos at school and then I would film after. And every day I'd have like 30 minutes to maybe 90 minutes of footage. And then I would mm -hmm. edit videos from like 9am to like three or four in the morning. And I do that every single day. And I did, I did that for like, you know, plus 700 days, not in a row necessarily, I would do like the most I did, I think was like a hundred something days in a row. That's um, crazy. But I, on my goal card, I literally wrote like my goal, which was like a certain amount of followers. And it was, the goal was like, um, I, Arlen Moore, what is the Napoleon Hill formula? It's like Arlen Moore will attract, you know, whatever it was, 10 million followers by X date. Um, and in exchange for these followers, I will provide, videos of the highest quality and quantity that entertain, inspire, and enlighten people to become the best versions of themselves and, um, and add more value to the world. Mm -hmm. And, and then the next line was something like, I feel the enjoyment and the power of my followers and fans, like watching these videos and like pulling for me to be like, essentially like I, I really focused on 
the people that I was impacting. Mm. And people say this too. Like, I mean, my friend recently had a kid. When you have a family or when you have a child, you have more, you unlock another level of like spiritual energy Mm -hmm. um, and motivation. And like, in the same way we were just talking about, you know, how like dark spirits can take over you, like light spirits and like, you know, good positive energy can also overtake you and give you a reservoir of energy that you didn't previously have. So, you know, people who struggle with motivation, it's like if once you make commitment to like serving others um, and and you start to really consciously think about it and like, you know, with what you're doing, Jacob, I don't know if you'll, you're starting to notice, but you're starting to have a lot more impact on the world um, than you previously were because you're building a brand and you're inspiring people. And because you're inspiring people, you are going to feel inspired by some kind of energy that previously you didn't really know about. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Cause like whether I'm traveling or whether I'm home, it's like, I'm still fueled by this, the idea of like serving as many people as I can. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it's, it's like, I shouldn't have a lot of energy right now. <laughs> like I went to bed at four in the morning. Um, I, this coffee is awful. I didn't really drink it. Um, but I know that there's people out there that are going to find this very valuable. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, I don't know, you, like my heart feels warm when I just like share this kind of stuff. And I, and I've watched a lot of Eckhart Tolle. I don't know if you've, have you consumed any Eckhart? Mm-mm. Oh, really? Oh, well, he's, he's like, uh, you definitely should. Yeah. I mean, you have Alex, he's like your guru, but, mm-hmm. um, no, Eckhart's great. Eckhart Tolle. He's like, a. He wrote this book called The Power of Now, and a lot of what he talks about is just how to – a lot of what I've actually taught guys in, in Tribe Accelerator and with social skills about how to never run out of things to say is actually – it actually stems from Eckhart Tolle because when he – like one of my favorite things that he does and that he talks about and just kind of a – I mean, all of his videos are viral, but there's one in particular where he's like – a lot of people ask me when I go up on stage and start talking about, you know, the things that I talk about, is there a script? Like, you know, do I plan what I'm going to say? And the truth is that I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to say. I don't even know what the next word that's going to come out of my mouth is. I'm just talking and being guided by some people might call it God. Some people might call it, you know, it, I don't know. It's, it's whatever you want to, be led by but um mm-hmm. but yeah that's that's the honest answer is like you the more people you you want to have a positive impact on the more you're able to be motivated and inspired i think you'll find that a lot over time yeah no that makes sense cuz i've i've definitely had time periods in my life where i've been just just so much energy and mm-hmm. i just, you just feel unstoppable so it's yeah. being it's just being un- being able to unlock that and then it doesn't really matter when you go to bed when you wake up where you're at you're just so you're so stoked on the day yeah what you, what you get to do that day not what you have to do that day that you just yeah. jump into it and just attack it Makes sense. well for you you you've certainly tapped into that energy because when you're selling gym launch i mean correct me if i'm wrong but basically you're selling helping gyms Mm -hmm. launch or expand their gyms right Mm -hmm. and like that's an incredibly light and positive thing to be putting into the world so you're Mm -hmm. contributing to just other people's health and extreme just like life fulfillment like imagine you do one gym launch sale how many people in that town that go to that gym are affected exactly so like you are fueled by the their energy No, it's, it's something super powerful to think about. And I feel like a lot of times you can get, or at least I can get so sucked into the day to day. That's like, you almost need someone to say, Hey, look at this through a different perspective or a different lens to really see the bigger picture and the, mm. the actual impact you can make. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, um, I'm looking at our, our list here, building social circle without college. Oh, you, you wanted to ask me how was my first sales experience? Um, before or as i was building my business yeah what was because i'm so curious because i jumped into the game doing 
I had the drop shipping. I had the um, mobile car washing business, the real estate. But I guess I ju jumped into the game focused and on sales. And I don't know from your business, it, it might have been focused in on something else. And then sales is something I don't know if it was done intentionally or you're just having conversations. So I was, I'm just so curious on that experience. Yeah. So it was funny when you, I wanted to bring this up, but you were talking about how you asked me if I'd ever done cold calls. And I was like, no, mm -hmm. but I, my problem, funny enough, and I'll explain why is actually I had the opposite. I had the opposite, the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. My first sales calls were with YouTube viewers of my channel from like the last five years. So they mm. were actually more like mega fans mm. rather so than cold calling. Fan. Yeah. They were like mega fans. They'd watched all my videos for like years. Mm -hmm. And I was learning from, um, this course that I'd got is Sam ovens course is like consulting accelerator thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, the way that that script is written in that course back in the day, uh, when he was still selling it, it was like, it was like a 12 step script. And he, I mean, the reason he wrote it that way is because he didn't think that people like his target niche was not people who had 170,000 subscriber YouTube channels. His mm -hmm. niche was like mom and pops who want to start a consulting business. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of them would be like basically cold calling or doing sales um, and had never done sales before. So he had to like really have a script that was very controlling. So my first sales experience was reading an extremely control controlled uh, script to ex an extremely warm audience. <laughs> so you 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 already know like how fucking yeah. awkward that might that must have been for <laughs> me and for them because here's this just like this just amped up kid basically like eighteen year old kid and I also didn't realize that eighteen year olds like don't really have money. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm talking to like 17, 18 year old kids and like, they've been following me for years. And then I get on and I'm like, I'm like chit chat for two minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> where are you calling in from? <laughs> and then it's like, unpack the problem. Okay. Well, what motivated you to book this call today? All right. What's the, like, you know, it's just like, it was so painfully awkward. I did it for like 30 days, I think. Uh -huh. um, and I had no problem like booking calls because everyone just wanted to talk to me, but I was, I made no sales. And I think I just pissed a lot of my own followers off because they were mm -hmm. like, wait, you want me to pay you $2,000? Like, I don't have any money, dude. Like, I just, what, what the fuck? Like, it was just so weird and uncalibrated. Um, and then I, I honestly gave up for a long time. And then mm -hmm. I had another mentor that pushed me to get back into it. Mm -hmm. And sort of gave me a different angle on how to do the calls, which was just a lot more conversational and like understanding that these kids just like kind of wanted to be more like me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why they were watching my videos. And I didn't even have an offer. Like my offer was, I have a group. Do you like Arlen's YouTube videos? Do you want to talk to him a couple times a week? Okay, bye. And, um, yeah, so I didn't have an offer. It was just like, do you want to be with me sometimes and on a Zoom call? Just hang out. <laughs> and like, yeah, and other people. That was it. Like, do you, it was basically, do you think I can help you with X? Okay. Bye. So I did that and just a lot more like organic style of sales calls mm -hmm. um, rather than super scripted. And in my head, I was, I actually was thinking, like, can I actually help this person? So yeah. I think I made like 10 grand in the first week. Um, the product was 2,500 at the time. And I was like, wow, that's great. You know, how did that um, feel? How did that feel with that first 10 grand week? Well, I mean, I'd made a good amount of money before cause I had done merch and stuff. Uh -huh. So I had made like 60 grand in like a few days, but then the, the margins on that were probably like, I really made like 35 or 40 grand. Um, and that, so I was used to kind of being able to do that. So it wasn't like new to money, but pure in like info product, no costs involved other than like Stripe fees mm -hmm. to just kind of pull money out of thin air was definitely eye opening. Crazy. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. And so that, that kind of leads back to like one of the biggest pieces of advice Alex gave me was like actually care. 
And then understanding, yeah. because I think every salesperson goes through that journey where they see the script, they read the script and then realize, oh, this is very awkward. But if you can see the script, understand, because they weave sales psychology into every script. Like that's how right. they write them, typically, if it's a good script. So then if you can unpack and understand, why do you, why do you say this in the intro? This is the tonality you use. How do you set the frame of the call and then actually care about the person? Then you can just take, take it to the next level and have it feel organic and not have it feel super weird. When you get to the close, it's easier to close because you're actually listening and understanding the person rather than just trying to do these tacky objection handling tactics that just come off. Yeah. A bit yeah. So to, to kind of, um, talk a bit on that and also bring the story sort of up to where it is now. Um, I realized that part of what I needed to do was qu pretty quickly get, uh, someone to do the sales calls for me because mm -hmm. I sh like as the brand that I built, like I shouldn't really be the one selling. Like yeah, I should kind of like, not like good cop, bad cop, but like you know, my mentor at the time was like, you know, you, you need like a money hungry sales guy who can like twist people's arm and it doesn't really reflect poorly on you. Mm -hmm. So I had, I had a guy like that for a while. And um, that's when I started getting into like, you know, 40, 50, 60 grand months. And it was cool, but it was also still very forced. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started kind of taking it into my own hands more. And I stopped working with that mentor. And I brought on someone who had basically just been a diehard fan follower of mine, who had mm -hmm. zero sales experience, but had just such a good heart and like wanted to help. And he was, he also had bought my mentorship program too. Um, and I could just tell like this guy just really wants to fucking help people. Mm -hmm. And like I told him when he first started doing calls, I was like, listen, like I'm not going to give you a script. All I want you to do is just, you've taken my course. Like you've been on calls with me. You've seen how I can help people. Um, when you get on calls with guys, just genuinely listen to them and just imagine like, okay, could Arlen help this guy? Mm -hmm. That's it. And then that's pretty much where we are now is um, I have a couple guys on the team that, are just really good dudes and like they wouldn't sell someone on my offer if they didn't think it could really help them. So, yeah. which is great. And that's the same thing because when you're, you're talking about, I think the skill set's super important to develop, but also the conviction in the product. Yeah. And that's really interesting yeah. that you took someone from your program because most of the people who sold at gym launch and sell at gym launch are former clients. Uh, interesting. So they've been through it. They scaled their gym to a million a year, sold their gym or still have their gym on the side. So when they jump into it, they're so convicted in the product and they know it works Yeah, that they can talk to that person. And then it just takes, okay, this is why you say these certain things. This is how you hold the frame of the conversation. If they give you this objection, it's probably a smoke screen. This is how you loop around it and actually get to the real thing to help that person. Right. right. So that's interesting that you took someone from the program yeah. that was like actually convicted in what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the second guy. Like a lot of guys that join Tribe Accelerator, you know, they want a, a solid group of like guy friends that they can travel with mm -hmm. and, you know, meet chicks and such. And so this guy, JT, who was in my course, like he did a trip to Bali with a bunch of guys in the program and like went from, pretty shy like kid with not a ton of friends to mm -hmm. you know, now he's in Bali with like the cute chicks and like the cool dudes and like that's exactly what everyone a lot of guys want that end up joining mm -hmm. and so when he's on the call it's like it's the easiest sell for him he's like oh <laughs> you want to like go to whatever San Tropez with a bunch of cool dudes who make money too and like okay yeah like here's what I did so yeah push button solution yeah, he's just like shows his Instagram. He's like, yeah, this is it. This is how yep. I did it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that 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 covers that. Were there any other topics? I want to make sure we we get everything. Um, Jens Cook K Club. Um, we talked about the spiritual stuff for a while. <laughs> uh, let's see. Social circle. Building own biz. Travel and work. I think we covered most of everything. Is there any last thoughts on your mind? I guess just the 
if people want to contact you, right? Like Instagram and boom. Boom. Look at that. <laughs> so are you going to release? I, I mean, I, I don't think you have like an offer yet, but are you going to have something in the future where people can learn directly from you? We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. It's yeah. yeah. The, the most important thing for me is just making sure because there's like two types. I'm all about long-term thinking. So yeah. what's going to serve me in the next 10 years? I want to, if I create an education company, I want to create a billion dollar education company, right? Mm -hmm. And in order for that to happen, I need to, I don't want to be the guy that steps into sales, does a couple months of sales and then tries to sell how to sell. Right. right. So like at, at this point I've, I've been, been doing high ticket sales for two years, probably taken 4,000 sales calls. So I feel confident in that skill and what I've been doing recently. And you can, it's in my Instagram bio. You can apply to the sales group. I don't, I don't want to let everyone in just cause I'm trying to keep it small right now. And then I'm teaching, I'm trying to build my skill set to teach other people for free until I know I'm very, very, very good at it. That way I don't affect the brand of what I'm doing. Right. Because I think there's only one thing you can do and it's protect the brand because you know how powerful your brand is when people jump on the call and they've been following you for years. So Someday, maybe. We'll see. I love it. Cool. I think you did a good job, Jacob. I don't think you have to worry about being awkward on interviews. And you have <laughs> great stories. Um, I think my favorite part is is our shared experience. Honestly, I think the best part of this interview is is Alex looking at you <laughs> and just saying, <laughs> why did you think you could do that? that is, <laughs> that's a great it's... clip. That needs to be clipped. <laughs> It, it, it's so obvious now, but it was so, yeah. <laughs> why, why did he say that at the time? You know? Uh, all right, cool. All right. Well, Jacob, thanks for coming on. Um, guys follow Jacob on Instagram. He has nothing to sell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's funny. Uh, except gym launch, maybe. Yeah. Except gym. If you own a gym or know a gym owner, hit us up. <laughs> cool. All right, Jacob. Enjoy the rest of your day. Sweet. You have a you have a